Hello, and welcome to Farm Buds, compounding professional narratives with student perspectives. I'm Sierra. And I'm Liz. Today we are joined by Dr. Joe Lampson, a clinical toxicology fellow at the University of Utah. Hello, Joe. Hello. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So, um, you know, uh, we just kind of want to talk a little bit about pharmacy. And and so uh, with that, I'll start. Why pharmacy? Yeah, great question. So uh, when I was doing my undergrad, I was a biochemistry major, and I really liked biochemistry. I liked understanding chemical structures, but I realized very quickly that I also liked anatomy, physiology, those type of subjects as well. So as I got further into my curriculum with biochemistry, I realized I was less about laboratory work and laboratory techniques and more about what do drugs do to the body or what do different chemical compounds do to the body. So ultimately, last minute decision, I applied to pharmacy school, I got in, and that's ultimately what got me into pharmacy. That's wild. But not, you didn't want to be a chemist. I initially did. And then I did some research as an organic chemist and poked myself too many times oh, yeah, with yeah, yeah. some who knows what anymore at this time. This is true. Uh, so I realized I was kind of a hazard to the laboratory and decided patient care was probably a better option. <laughs> That's so funny. Which is kind of ironic since pharmacists, you know, obviously yeah. deal with medications and injections and an inpatient deal with that type of stuff. But well, vaccines are kind of our thing now. Yeah. Let's just say I've gotten proper training for injections, whereas I did not in the laboratory. I could totally see you as a chemist. That is the key. I'll tell you, though, I'm left handed. So oh, when they gosh. were teaching us how to do it, um, the resident that I was with was very right handed. Mm -hmm. And it's a little intimidating to watch someone. <laughs> hold a needle with their left hand and try to give a subcutaneous injection for the first time. So that took a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and my partner still teases me about it. <laughs> Understandably so. So um, we got a little bit of that, your background and your history and about chemistry. That's really interesting. Um, but aside from just like the educational development and learning that you've gone through, what educational training do you have? Um, so I already mentioned my bachelor's of science in biochemistry, mm -hmm. obviously PharmD, mm -hmm. um, currently pursuing board certification for toxicology. So wow. that's where I'm at in my career. That's amazing. Can you talk a little bit about the distinction between like residencies and fellowships? Because as we're in school, they kind of sell it as fellowships being uh, more about research and residencies being more clinic-based. Mm -hmm. um, has that reigned true for your experience? Yeah, I would say generally speaking that that's true. Residency is typically a little bit more clinical and fellowship is a little bit more research-oriented. Uh, the way I like to think about it is residencies uh, are standardized. They follow ASHP accreditation standards, whereas fellowships often are more of a make your own experience. And so it really depends on the institution you're doing the fellowship for, whether it's purely research or if it has a clinical component to it as well. Um, and, and so you'll notice that residencies are pretty standard across the nation. If you're doing a PGY-1, you're pretty much going to be doing very similar activities, no matter where you're at. Maybe um, the type of elective type of rotations or the type of projects you do will vary, but You'll have a staffing component. You'll have a base number of rotations that you have to do that are inpatient versus outpatient. Um, whereas when you look more at fellowships, my first year fellowship was 100% in the emergency room and in the ICUs. So it was essentially like a PGY-2 in emergency medicine or in ICU in critical care, um, but something that I did in my first year fellowship without any residency training. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, because you know sometimes it's not that there's a a less or more in terms of intensity for a fellowship versus a residency, but it is there is this push for residency over fellowship. Sometimes we feel like, and so we just wanted to know if you could provide any, and you kind of did, but that light as to why there's more of a push for residency than than so a fellowship. Mm -hmm. 
I think it depends which industry you're pursuing. So if you want to be inpatient or more ambulatory care focused, mm -hmm. residency sets you up very well for that. Okay. So it gives you a very general experience. Uh, it helps you see pharmacy practice in a lot of different areas inside the hospital and out. And so um, I would say that's why most people pursue that type of opportunity if that's the type of job they're looking for. Um, whereas a fellowship will give you more of that academic or research or policy and administration component. And so if that's more what you're looking for, those are the type of people who typically tend to go over to a fellowship. Okay. That makes sense. So then I guess the next obvious question is, why did you decide to pursue a fellowship? So I was very fortunate and did my pharmacy internship at the Poison Control Center here at Utah. And so right from probably not day one, but very shortly after I started my internship, I learned about the fellowship position. There were a couple of the employees there who had done the fellowship. And so it always intrigued me. I wanted to know kind of like what you were saying, what is a fellowship? Yeah. Because we always talk about residency. We do. And why do these people look so happy in what they're doing? Exactly. If they didn't do a residency. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of what got me interested in the fellowship initially was just seeing people who had done the fellowship working at the Poison Control Center and ultimately seeing that it aligned better with what my career goals and career aspirations were. Yeah. And and just kind of piggyback on that, like, so you did that, you did an internship at Poison Control, but then how did you end up applying for this fellowship? Was it just kind of because you were, you did that intern at Poison Control? How did that work? And would that be kind of the same way that, you know, others who wanted to pursue a fellowship, it wouldn't just like, I'm not saying it fell into your lap, but because you did that internship, do you think you had a little bit more leverage? Or do you think that there's opportunity for people that do internships in these types of niche areas? Those fellowships are a little bit more of a, uh, more accessible for them, I guess. Mm -hmm. So across the nation, I think currently there are about five or six toxicology fellowships. And of all the fellows currently, I believe I'm the only one who did an internship at the Poison Control Center. Oh, wow. So definitely an opportunity for people if they're interested mm -hmm. in that type of fellowship, even if you've had no background in a Poison Control Center previously. Uh, most of those other fellows have done a PGY-1 or even a PGY-2 in either emergency medicine or critical care. So they're kind of adding it as additional education on top of their fellowship. Um, I hope that answers it your did. question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. That's I really didn't interesting. know that. Yeah. And then I guess we'll move on and sort of wrap up this little portion about um, what should pharmacy students know about fellowships? We kind of touched on a lot of things, but is there one big takeaway? My big takeaway is that fellowships are very interesting opportunities to grow as professionals and as pharmacists. And they're sometimes harder to find information about. So with residencies, you can go onto ASHP's website and you can see the list of the different residency programs. There's mid-year. There's a lot of marketing for those type of opportunities, whereas fellowships Sometimes you have to contact the institution to see if they're even providing a fellowship, or you have to contact them to see what their deadlines and their due dates are. You have to contact them to see what the experience really looks like. And so if you're interested in a fellowship, my big take home is start looking early. If you're trying to decide between a residency and a fellowship, uh, just start researching earlier and ask people who are doing fellowships what they did to find those opportunities and see what different opportunities they are to see if maybe that aligns better with your goals versus a residency, or if it's something you'd even want to add to a residency, which, again, is definitely what some people do. That's crazy. That's crazy. So then, I guess, what does a day in your professional life look like? So it definitely varies mm -hmm. week to week, month to month. So in my first year of fellowship, like I mentioned, I was 100% rotating at different hospitals. So I'd either be in the emergency room, uh, rotating with the emergency room pharmacist or in the ICU with the critical care pharmacist. And so that's kind of what my first year looked like. Lots of inpatient work. And then also some weeks of project time, essentially jump-starting some of my research projects that have carried on into the second year. Mm -hmm. So fast forward into the second year, uh, 
essentially I come in, work on some research projects before we have our rounds at the Poison Center, which happens about nine o'clock. We do rounds for a few hours. If we have any patients that are within any of our institutions on site, so the University of Utah or Primary Children's Hospital, we'll go and do some bedside consultations in the morning, evaluate the patient, give our recommendations to the team. After that, we'll sometimes have some topic discussions and things like that for our learners and our students who are rotating with us. And then the rest of the time is really up to me to make sure I'm getting my projects taken care of and um, accomplished by their due dates. So that's kind of a, a general day-to-day um, what I do at the Poison Center. How do you identify the patients that you end up talking about on rounds? Are Do most of those patients come to you through the Poison Center's hotline, or is there some other method? So majority are going to be through the Poison Center hotline. So essentially... A, A physician or even someone from home who ends up having to go to the hospital will call into the poison center. We'll start up a case for that individual. And then if that patient requires being admitted to the hospital, whether to a non-critical care floor or a critical care floor, then that gets passed on to our morning team, which is composed of the pharmacy students, medical students, residents. um, And that's how they get their list of patients on their docket. (sighs) <sighs> that's crazy. I remember shadowing at the poison control for half an hour. It was wild. <laughs> it was wild. It was really fun, though. Um, I guess, you know, because, and, and that's and, and why I had to take a big pause there was just because when I was shadowing, I mean, I'm watching, you know, pharmacists in, poison, in the poison control center, and it leads, it, it leads us to ask, what is the most difficult part about being a pharmacist who works in poison control? I mean, you have patients humans, people, moms, dads, people calling and they're in sheer panic sometimes. And it's just, how do you, how do you handle that? Like, is there a difficult part being in, you know, working in poison control or in toxicology and what is it? I'd say the hardest part is what some people really enjoy as well. It's that you're at the mercy of the phone. And so you'll have some moments where you really don't have a lot of phone calls. The phone calls that you get are pretty uncomplicated, don't require a lot of management. People are really not too panicked, and so it makes for a pretty easy hour compared to other hours where the phone is just ringing nonstop. You're having to handle multiple calls at a time because essentially you want to make sure whoever's on hold is safe and doesn't need to emergently be transported to the emergency room. So a lot of multiple call handling, maybe in that situation you have more panicked callers, and so you're really trying to keep people level-headed while you're trying to get all the information you need to make a good risk assessment. And then maybe at the same time, you have individuals at the hospital who are critically ill and requiring different interventions, whether it's antidotes or different recommendations for supportive care. And so that makes for a very difficult hour where you essentially have the worst of the worst all at once versus the best of the best all at once. But again, some people really like that. They, They like the challenge They like interacting with patients in that way where they're really in a moment of crisis and you can either help them relax and realize it's not going to be a big issue or get them the type of care that they need based off of how serious the situation is. And people really vibe with that. And I think that's why a lot of people choose this type of work in pharmacy uh, in the end. Yeah. It's crazy. Do you find any unique challenges when you're talking to the public over the phone? Because I think historically um, pharmacists are seen as a professional that does um, their work in person. Definitely the most difficult part of being on the phones is you have to verbally assess everything. So you can't have any visual cues or anything like that. It's all audio. So if someone tells you, you know, this person is unconscious you that means they're unconscious Mm -hmm. but to them maybe what it really meant was well they're really sleepy and when i poke them they get annoyed at me but they just want me to leave them alone and so from a public standpoint that's their definition of unconscious whereas for us that means they're comatose they're at risk of respiratory depression maybe at risk of cardiac arrest depending on what's going on and so that makes it really difficult to provide 
an appropriate risk assessment because we really are just trusting whatever the caller is telling us. And and so like in that case, do you, I think it comes down to just terminology and words and, and, and are there ways that in a situation like that, obviously you wouldn't just, you do want to trust who's ever on the other line, the patient, the, the person, but are there follow-up questions? And if so, how are those follow-up questions worded in such a way where it's not seeming as if you're, you have doubt, but that you are also giving them an opportunity to be a little bit more specific without saying, Hey, I need you to be more specific. Right. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, being on the phones, you become very good at follow-up questions, open-ended questions, any, essentially anything to get them to say as much as they can. So you can get a full picture of what's happening. So, in our unconscious patient, you know, the follow-up question could be, oh, okay, they're unconscious. So if you talk to them, will they respond to you? Okay. So obviously never demeaning of, well, are you sure you know what unconscious right. means? Right. That would never go well and obviously is very inappropriate. But so, things to help, Yeah. you know, do they respond to you? If you touch them, will they wake up? Uh-huh. Help me understand how unconscious they are. Okay. And in that way, you can get more information. Right. Follow-up. Oh. Questions, open-ended questions. That's they all teach we're you taught. that in school. And Everything it and, we, is a thing. and you know what's funny <laughs> is we were just like, all we try at first because we were very. I wouldn't say we're naive, but we were always just like, "How is your day?" <laughs> so <laughs> everything felt like the tone had to be in a question, so that maybe we were leaving it open, and that is not a, what that's about. So it's just very interesting to see, you know, it in practice. And hear you say that's very important, you know, because. Keep practice opening the end of questions, Sierra. We have to keep going. <laughs> a lot of our running jokes um, revolve around reflective listening these days. Mm-hmm. So what I'm hearing is... Yeah. So what I'm hearing... <laughs> the take-home message that you would like me to take away from this conversation is... <laughs> Open-ended questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we utilize that all, a lot on the phone as well. You yeah. know. So my take-home is your friend is completely passed out and there's nothing we can do to wake them up. And they say, yes. And then we say, well, based off of that, then I really think you need to call 911 so EMS can come and evaluate your friend. And they say, oh, well, actually, yeah. let me change my story. If I do poke them, they do kind of wake up. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes that, that helps people okay. realize right. how serious the situation is based off of what they're saying and helps them maybe reconsider how to more appropriately paint the picture of what's actually happening. Mm-hmm. Now, I have a question for you. And, and before even pharmacy, I had to call poison control once in my life and I was little. But pharmacist never came to my mind. I never knew that that was a pharmacist on the other line. I never knew that. I thought it was just someone that knew something that knew something, right? Or a doctor or something. Do, do you think that the public is aware that pharmacists do this? Or, I mean, what goes in how, how – it's just very bizarre. People just pick up the phone. They call the number on the back of a bottle that says call poison control. And then they're talking to somebody. So there's like this innate trust that they're just calling this number, right? But realistically, they don't really know who they're talking to. And so I guess, how does that make you feel, you know, in, in how can we make the public more aware that these, because they already call, they call, poison control is called. So I guess it's just kind of ironic that you guys are just, the trust is just there. And so my question is, you, you Do you find it weird that nobody really questions anything about poison control? Or do you feel that, you know, pharmacists are are important, but that they're just not saying poison control pharmacists. It's just poison control. Mm -hmm. Does that, you know what I mean? Like, I I guess it's it's difficult for me to define, but I, like I said, as somebody before pharmacy school, I had no idea I was talking to a pharmacist. Yeah. And so, I don't know. Well, so first off, really depends on which center you're calling into. Oh, I didn't know that. uh, At the Utah Poison Control Center, we're mm-hmm. predominantly pharmacists. We have one nurse who works with our call center staff as well. Okay. Other centers, though, will be 100% nurse-based or oh. maybe a mi- more of a mixture of the two. Some will also have physicians on board okay. in their call center. So really depends on which center you're calling in. But okay. what makes them consistent center to center is they all have to go through additional toxicology training. Okay. So after a year or a certain number of hours of being on the phone, they are allowed to sit for a toxicology certification test, which essentially demonstrates that they have been well educated and well formed on toxicology principles specifically and overdose management. 
Okay. So what you're saying is the pharmacist is kind of a niche thing for that Utah has kind of, because they're not all like that. That's Correct, interesting. Yeah. Other centers are also very pharmacist based. So it really just depends. Right. Um, and so where we're in part of the College of Pharmacy, yeah. I think that's kind of how it transitioned to Utah being more pharmacist based. But oh. um, again, doesn't neglect the fact that nurses, physicians right. elsewhere in the country are doing the exact same type of work yeah. as here. Yeah, because that was the impression that I got when I would, would call poison control that it wasn't a pharmacist. So to find out that pharmacists can and do do that was very, very interesting and cool to kind of see that movement. So, mm-hmm. And for me, it makes sense. A lot of people yeah. are calling about, over, you know, double doses, overdoses. So you're thinking a lot about mechanisms of action of the yeah. drugs, what that would look like in, oh, no, I took half my bottle by accident yeah. or on purpose, obviously on depending on the circumstances. Yeah. And pharmacists are well-trained to think about those questions because they, they know the drugs so well. Yeah, cool. But to answer your other question, yeah. um, you know, how, how does it make us feel that yeah. the public maybe doesn't know yeah. the extent of training for specialists on the phone? Um, I don't think specialists are really offended by that. I think yeah. they just see it as a way to educate. Yeah. So many times on the phone, I'll have someone say, hey, thank you for the recommendation. I hope you're not offended, but I just want to know, why can I trust you? <laughs> is essentially right. what they say. But what I background do you have I for know where I can that. actually trust you? Oh. And so then it's a really good education moment to say, well, I'm a pharmacist by training, but I have extensive toxicology training or whatever the background of the specialist wow. is. And that by the end of the call, they say, wow, I had no idea that you had to yeah. go through so much training to answer these type of phone calls. Yeah, 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 I didn't. Yeah. Well, and for me, that kind of brings up the point of, do you guys have to follow a script or is it pretty tailored to the caller? Very much tailored to the caller. So we definitely have a template of different questions we want to make sure that we ask. That just helps with consistency between our staff and then make sure that we're asking all the pertinent questions to really have a full workup. Mm-hmm. Pretty similar to a review of systems or something like that that you would do inpatient or outpatient. Mm-hmm. But there is in no way a document that we have pulled up that says, ask this question first, then ask this question. So we would never stop a caller and say, hold on, we're out of order. We need to ask these questions in a different way. Mm-hmm. It's very fluid and up to the specialist on the phone how they want to tailor the conversation to that specific caller. And I think that's really great for the public to know, too, because I think we've all had uh, an experience where we call into a hotline or something, and it's very obvious that the person at the other line is there to help you, but they're following this script (laughs) that they cannot deviate from. And so it's great to know that you guys are able to really take the individual patient into account. I guess we will move on to talking about how do you decompress? Yeah. So I thought about this question a lot through pharmacy school, and I have a healthy option and an unhealthy option. So I'm happy to share both if we you want. Both. Yes, please. <laughs> we do. need both. Yeah, we we're, need we're both. actively looking. We're Girl. active. That's well, why we're we actively looking question. for the unhealthy portion. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, no, true. Well, we'll start out with the healthy. Um, I really like classical piano. I'm not very good at it, but I find that it's a really good way to de-stress and decompress. And so um, I'll pull up some old classical music. Chopin is definitely one of my favorite artists and composers. And so I'll just play for maybe 10, 15 minutes if I really need a, you know, half an hour, hour. Um, That's very rare, though. Obviously not enough time in life to, to do that. But that really helps me decompress and kind of put my anxieties or angers or stresses or disappointments or whatever happened in the day into the music. And then I can be at home and move on from that and and feel a little more stable in that way. So that's the healthier option. The unhealthy option, I love picking out on any type of terrible food like Taco Bell. Not Mm -hmm. to bash on Taco Bell. I love Taco Bell. Taco Bell, Bell ice cream, whatever it is, and just be in front of a movie. So you can find me not infrequently in front of Netflix or Hulu and just eating very unhealthy food. Yeah, it sounds about right. Sometimes you need it. Sometimes you do need it. Yeah. Although, you know, I don't know what you're watching. Now we got some new shows coming up, but t- tangent. There really was a period of time where I couldn't find anything good. So I was rewatching 
old things because <laughs> I was super desperate, but I relate. I relate. I, okay. So <clears throat> you decompress. Um, if sometimes part of my decompression follows into and is a result of this topic, which is imposter syndrome, have you experienced this? You're lying if you didn't. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but how do you combat that? And, and But most importantly, not even just combat it, but how did you learn to navigate dealing with if you had imposter syndrome or experienced that during pharmacy school and even in your current practice? I definitely have felt and still feel imposter syndrome. I think it's pretty natural. Mm -hmm. For me, where it stems from is just my expectation of where I should be at. Mm -hmm. So I remember as a fourth-year pharmacy student, I felt like when I was on rotation, I should be performing like a resident, which saying out loud sounds kind of silly. You're a fourth year pharmacy student. You haven't gone through fourth year pharmacy school. So why should you perform like a resident should? But then, of course, I get to fellowship level and I think the same thing. Now, instead of feeling like I should be at a fellow level, I feel like I should be at a pharmacist level who's been doing it for five or 10 years. And uh, I, for me, I, I discovered that's where the imposter syndrome stemmed from. Mm -hmm. And so to combat that, it was rethinking what my expectations were and being very clear in my communication with others where I was at and what my actual level of understanding was um, to get the help that I needed to improve and no longer feel like an imposter. It's mm. really good perspective, actually. It's so true because we're in P2, but we're acting. Sometimes I find myself, and I think it's just because of the level of trust from even in my role as an intern, uh, that they push you to do certain things. And you're like, mm, and in your mind, you're like, mm, but then somebody's, you know, kind of shuffling you along because they believe that you can or learn or try. And you're right. You know, it's almost like, no, I'm still, I'm still here. And, and I could see that. So that's kind of an interesting perspective. I don't mean that to say, you know, you should never take opportunities exactly. to learn and grow. Exactly. But as you take those opportunities, recognizing and that. letting people around you know, Key. this is the level I'm at. I'm going to do my best, but yes. I need support in this area because I've never done this before. Correct. Or in my case, where I'm in my second year of fellowship, I'm very comfortable with how we think through poison patients and how we manage a lot of poison patients. But if I haven't seen a type of overdose before, mm -hmm. because it's really rare, um, what helps me with the imposter syndrome is say, I know I need to think of about this overdose in this, you know, in this way, but I've never seen this specific overdose before. And so if I'm missing something, please let yeah. me know and help me learn from it. Because again, I've never seen this before. And so I can read in a textbook what to expect, but I have no clinical experience of actually seeing this before. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Don't shy away from an opportunity, but also don't don't say that you, you know, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Yes. Right. Well, and I think that's so important because as um, a healthcare professional that we have with us and two individuals that are training to be healthcare professionals, um, the public trusts us. And if you don't know what you're talking about, you should probably say so because it's much better to be honest with yourself and find the right answer than it is to tell someone the wrong answer because things can really spiral out of control fast in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Mm -hmm. So with that, what qualities make a good pharmacist, Joe? What makes a good pharmacist? <laughs> uh, I'd a say question. three different things. So first, being very proactive. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of areas in pharmacy are very new. And so it requires someone who is really willing to put themselves out there and make differences and make changes um, versus someone who just waits to be told what to do, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, second, I would say inquisitive. So obviously there are always new drugs. There are new ways to look at drugs. And so what makes a good pharmacist is someone who's always interested in learning and takes opportunities to ask questions and look for answers, mm -hmm. which we're trained very well to look at medical literature, and that's where a lot of the answers are. And then if there are no answers, being willing to kind of take a leap of faith and extrapolate to the situation that you're in. Um, and then third, I've kind of mentioned it already, but being very evidence-based. And so um, we don't always have evidence to support every decision we make, but we need to be comfortable that the decision we're making is at least 
backed up by whatever information we can get. And I see that specifically for toxicology where it's unethical to poison people. And so we really don't have randomized controlled trials of how to manage people. Mm -hmm. And so often we're basing a lot of things on less than gold standard type of studies, case reports, case series. And so that's the evidence we have. That's what we base it off. But we still base it off of that evidence. We don't just make things up. Right. And so for me, that's what makes a good pharmacist. When we talk about reading um, primary literature and trying to extrapolate the clinical significance of what's being presented in those papers, is there anything that um, pharmacy students should know as they start trying to do that? Because that's what we're doing right now. (laughs) (laughs) Do you do math? Do you do the math? Do you use the math? Do you need the math part of the article? Do you calculate your own? Do you (laughs) calculate your own hazards ratio, your odds ratios? I... You are talking to someone who really appreciated drug literature. We like it. So. But we feel like it's, we we just wanted to, we we feel like we spend a lot of time on that mathematical component and lose sight of what it is that that mathematical component provides. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's why, you know, there's some satire here, but that's why we're asking, (laughs) what, what does that, do you utilize that component when you're, you know, basing and doing evidence-based decision-making? I'd say definitely number needed to treat odds ratios, Mm -hmm. those type of things. They really show you the potentially the significance of a result. And so you can read a conclusion and it'll say, based off of the results of this study, this intervention is amazing, but it's really up to you as the healthcare professional to look at the numbers and to say, well, you're right. This is statistically significant, but I'm not impressed with this what this actually means clinically. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of emphasis put on the number crunching in school, just so you can get really comfortable with it Uh and um, kind of have it be more of a second nature Uh type of skill. So then it's very easy and more comfortable to actually apply it clinically after the fact. So we just got schooled. Push through it. It's worth it. Can we pull through it? (laughs) You can also pull through it. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, we do like drug lit. We do have fun. I think it's just um, tough in our curriculum because uh, we, we're we like STEM students, right? Like we're all like sciencey people. We don't spend a lot of time reading so much. So I think it's kind of a mind shift to be back in that zone where we're reading these things and analyzing them that way. So I think that's why it's a little tough for students, but I actually really like it too. <laughs> I don't want to pull you. I would say, I think what's really hard is the therapeutics component is so heavy. So it sometimes feel di- feels difficult to balance it all. And I totally acknowledge and recognize that having been there myself. Mm-hmm. But my take home was therapeutics exposes you to topics, mm-hmm. whereas drug lit exposes you to skill sets. And so, and so does therapeutics, Mm -hmm. but, um, there's a lot of memorization that goes into therapeutics besides just the general pharmacy principles. Whereas in drug lit, you're really focusing on just refining your skills of interpreting medical literature. And so that's why I always put in a plug in for drug literature. I think it's a class that's very beneficial. And when you end up going into practice, you will have memorized everything that you should for therapeutics. Um, and so what's cutting edge, it's what comes out in medical literature. Mm -hmm. And so for you to remain cutting edge in your career, it's really being able to dive deep into the, the guidelines, primary literature, whatever research comes out to support whatever you're doing in your career. This is true. Yeah, that's a really great point. That is a good point. Um, and then I guess we'll move on to what is one thing you wish the public knew about pharmacists? That were more than counting pills. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people say that, but uh, I always find it interesting when I tell people I'm a pharmacist that I either went to high school with or knew from before pharmacy school, and they always say, oh, so you just count pills, right? It's like, ugh, we're so much more than that. Walgreens, Smiths. I get that. They, they all, like, they all are more. So you work at CVS and Walgreens? I'm like, 
everybody says nobody likes going there. Why do you keep thinking that's from? It's so bizarre. It's like those the pharmacists who work there are intelligent. Oh yeah, they've done amazing things, and all we see is that they're counting pills from the other side of the counter. And so I like to educate the public in that situation and say, well, I don't know if you know, but that pharmacist you're talking about at CVS is actually a doctorate in pharmacy, has a doctorate in pharmacy. And this is what they're thinking about when they're actually counting those pills and looking through your medication list. And they are always so amazed. Oh, I should actually be nicer to my pharmacist. Yeah. Like, yes, you should. <laughs> yeah. Be nice to everyone. It doesn't matter what they're doing, but be nice to your pharmacist yes, too. Exactly. 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 Well, and in this day and age, like the distribution of the pills is like the least of the worries, right? I mean, we get it in there and we have robots that are counting this stuff. So I think a lot of it is how do we transition to using our clinical knowledge to serve our patients better than mm -hmm. just counting. <laughs> I agree. And I think if the public were more aware of what pharmacists are capable of, um, they'd probably utilize that resource more. And that could really help promote the pharmacy industry as a whole. And do you think that maybe also a lot of that, la and I don't want to say engagement with the public and a pharmacist um, is is big and variable because of the location. So like a retail setting and then like a clinical setting or like a pharmacy that's in a hospital, for instance. I feel like the patient in like interaction and engagement that I have working at like the University of Utah in, in even a retail setting outpatient is a lot more hands-on and a lot more interactive than sometimes these other places where it's just, we have a line, let's push it out. And so do you think that that is kind of contributing to that understanding of a pharmacist's role or what a pharmacist is capable of, depending on the setting? I think so. Yeah. Um, so just a little family background. Originally, my family's from France. And so I've gone back a few times, visited with some family and of course, I was interested to see what a pharmacist in France looked like. And talking to people there, their pharmacist is their first point of contact. If they're concerned of something, they'll go talk to their pharmacist, and their pharmacist kind of helps them triage what they should do. So if it's something over the counter that they can use, they'll help them with that education. If it's something that really requires them to go and be seen, then they'll provide that education as well. Uh -huh. And then really nice follow-up, because as you walk around in the streets of France, you see a lot of pharmacies, they're everywhere. And so everyone has their pharmacist. It's not that they go to a pharmacy, they go to their pharmacy. And so I, th I think you're right. I think a lot of it stems from people really just wanting to go in, go out, grab their medication, not build a relationship with their pharmacist like is done in other countries where yeah. I think it seems to be a little bit more successful. Did you know that he had family in France? Um, I, as of 30 seconds ago, <laughs> I'm still shocked. I'm shook right there. I had no idea. Why didn't you say that as an interesting fact one time? Well, it's not really an educational training, so <laughs> I wasn't sure how to bring it up. <laughs> I will say, though, if you ever take the toxicology elective here, um, and I'm still lecturing the plant lecture, mm -hmm. I go through how pharmacists in France are actually trained to identify mushrooms. And people will bring their mushrooms to the pharmacy to know if it's poisonous or not. Mushrooms so, are the thing. Wow. Mushrooms yes. are coming. Can Full I bring force. mushrooms to you? Can we? Yes. I am not trained in identifying mushrooms. Oh. If you tell me what mushroom it is, I can help you know if it's toxic or not. Oh. I can look at pictures with you, but mm. kind of lacked in our curriculum for sure here. Mushrooms. There's so many things. I went to Costco, side note again. I went to Costco the other day. Okay. Why are they? They're selling chocolate mushrooms. Choco shrooms? Choke oh, shrooms. Yeah. I've seen those. Like what? dark chocolate? I have not seen It's a these. mushroom dipped in the head of the mushroom is only dipped in chocolate. <laughs> but like what kind of chocolate? I have no, I don't know. I didn't look. I was freaked out by the fact that they're selling chocolate mushrooms. Can you get like caramel ones? No, I didn't okay. read it. It's it just, just was chocolate. a mushroom and it, it was a, bo it's in a box, like kind of like, you know, they would do um, like Ferrero Rocher mushrooms. Oh, okay. Okay. Mushrooms. Okay, so we're talking bougie. We're talking like gold. Bougie. Okay. <laughs> mushrooms are making a I'm comeback. On board. Remember when everyone despised mushrooms? Now all the talk is mushrooms. <laughs> okay, that's a good sign. So, but okay, so I guess <clears throat> as we get come to an end, and before we get into you know our, the last little bit here, as someone who either is has doesn't does not know what they want to do in general, 
or knows they want to maybe work with the public or like science or not, what advice could you give to someone either interested in pursuing pharmacy or trying to apply to pharmacy school? What is something, what is one piece of advice that you would share with them about pharmacy? Hmm. Either a career or school. That's a tricky question. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in applying to school, I think it's recognizing that there are a lot of different avenues in pharmacy. So when I went to pharmacy school, I thought I was signing up just to be a community pharmacy pharmacist. Um, and that was something I really enjoyed for the first few years of pharmacy school. But towards the end of my education, I realized that it ultimately wasn't what I was aspiring to, to have as a career. And so going in and realizing that schools will really push for residency, um, community will obviously push for community, industry will push for industry, but make sure you're choosing your own path. Do what you think really lines up with the type of work-life balance you're looking for, mm -hmm. the types of things that you want to be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, the things you want to learn about, and, um, and make sure that you go into pharmacy school with a very open mind so that you can explore a lot of different avenues. I would say that would be my big take-home. Be open-minded. Okay. Well, that seems like a pretty good place to leave it. I guess we will move on to the budding question. Okay, so... Uh, what should the public know about when to call poison control instead of 911? So, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. so essentially, if someone calls us and we think they should have called 911, we tell them to call 911 and we don't even go through a full history with okay. them. Okay. So, if ever you were to call the poison center and should have called 911, not a big issue. We're definitely going to make sure you get over to 911 like you should. But essentially, if someone is so sick from their exposure that they've passed out, they've stopped breathing, mm -hmm. they don't have a pulse, obviously very severe situations like that, anaphylaxis where their throat is closing up, that's a direct 911 call because 911 is who sends the paramedics over. Mm -hmm. 911 needs to be involved from the get-go get -go to get the paramedics over as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, otherwise, you can call the poison center for anything else, even if it's going to lead to that, but the patient isn't there quite yet. Mm -hmm. We can give information about what to expect. And then in that situation, often we'll recommend calling 911 at the end of the call or promptly getting to the hospital and then pulling over if needed in order to have 911 come you know, to your car if things escalated terribly while in transport. So uh, it really has to do with the severity of what's going on. But um, either way, if you call 911 and should have called the poison center because it's not as big of a deal, they'll transfer you right over to us. So we oh. definitely work a lot with 911 okay. where we have a very good relationship and there's a lot of transfer between the two. I just have like one tiny last bit question. Do you ever okay. call? Do you ever do you ever call and follow up with the patients or the person that you spoke to on the phone? A little bit shortly thereafter. So say it wasn't a 911, it wasn't emergent. Do you do a follow-up call? 100%. So we view awesome. our relationships with these patients as, um, you know, as, well, let me rephrase that. We, we really like to see a continuity of care. So mm -hmm. if we anticipate that you're going to have symptoms from an exposure, even if it's very mild, let's say you just got a cleaning product on your hand, may cause a little dryness and redness, mm -hmm. we are going to follow up in order to determine how severe it is. Because if it ends up being more severe than we thought, we really want to make sure that that caller is going to get the care that they need. And then if it ends up not being a big deal, then we can reassure people that moving forward, we would not anticipate things to worsen. So we definitely provide a lot of follow-up calls. Uh, we always ask permission. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of assumed that if you called in that you're allowing us to have that continuity of care, but we always like to ask at the end of the call, are you okay if I call you back in an hour just to make sure things are okay or uh -huh. tomorrow or whatever the timeline of yeah. the toxicity is? But yes, um, now to answer your question shortly, yeah. we definitely provide a lot of follow-up. I love that. I love that. I guess when we talk about acuity of care, um, how many patients are able to manage their condition at home with um, follow-up from you? And then how many end up having to seek a higher acuity of care, like going to the emergency room or something like that? 
I don't remember the number exactly off the top of my head, but it's anywhere between 75 and 85% of calls are managed at home. So one of the big pushes for poison centers is its cost saving. So we definitely help callers know when it's appropriate to go into the emergency room or not. And so by managing the majority of these cases that are appropriate to manage at home, obviously, Mm -hmm. by managing them at home, we're saving a lot of medical resources in the community. Um, The other 15 to 20% end up requiring evaluation at a hospital or they showed up at a hospital themselves and were just directly collaborating with the hospital in that situation. Um, But there's definitely some good cost savings there from that regard. We'll have to have you back to have an even more in-depth discussion on health resource management. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Health resource management. Well, Joe, thank you so much for coming today. We appreciate it. Do you have anything else that you'd like to ask? I think that's it for me. I'm still stuck on mushrooms, so my brain's <laughs> over there. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm just me. kidding. I always love talking about what I do in the Poison Center, so I was happy to chat with you both. Yeah. No, you shed some really good light on fellowships and residency because that's that's kind of what they hit us hard for, as, as students. That's what they hit us hard with is the residency. And so it's a really nice perspective to know um, – that there's another option. So, so thank you. This is the Farm Buds signing off. Until next time, stay, stay curious. curious. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Farm Buds podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the University of Utah. Farm Buds is not responsible for and does not verify the accuracy of any information contained in this series. This podcast does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. Primary purpose of this show is to educate, inform, and allow those in the pharmacy profession to tell their stories.